And and I'm going to turn my camera off as well. Just save bandwidth. Whoa, let me see if anybody's surprised when it takes over my whole screen. <laughs> do you all see yourself right now or do you see my other screen? We see your other I screen. I see the so screen. Implementing stable diffusion from its components. Okay, great house sharing on the other side. Um, yeah, so we were talking right before uh, you joined Torn about kind of the approach of moving forward in next direction is looking more at the um, looking at papers and incorporating those and kind of blending those in. So this was kind of, I believe, the first time that actually was kind of the main focus. Did you all have any questions or want to talk about the magic uh, or is there the uh, paper itself that uh, produced progressive distillation or are you good to kind of go further and look through it? Um, to the I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, yeah, so rest of distillation. So a lot of what we're looking at is um, MNIST, fashion MNSIT. Basically, we're generating uh, images. Um, so, you know, it, we're starting with a pre-trained model that was um, trained on 28 by 28 uh, grayscale models. Um, and we you can start to apply that to your own. And then the use case that he put in here was um, you know, developing these images and being able to, um, the artwork and so on through there. Um, and it is a bit more complex, um, but with it being a diffuser, um, looking through the hugging face, uh, and so on, there's a bit more information in regards to what the actual, um, uh, how it's being here. So um, the rest of the slides really were just some of the things. So um, PyTorch data loader was something that was used in here. Um, there was some, as somebody who probably uses Python more than R, um, which is, I think opposite from a lot of people here is the, I had the same reaction of we were doing this without uh, NumPy arrays, which uh, that was kind of the bit of the challenge is that not only are we doing this, but we're able to do it without um, the traditional way of using the uh, libraries to handle like matrices and so on. Uh, did that seem as more of an R user? Did that seem out of like, do you, does the Python kind of concepts and learning on the, the, reading the documentation and how certain things work, is that fairly understandable, clear, or um, was there any need for like going a little bit more detail about um, like the Python specific things that he was covering in there? Yeah, I think it was understandable from what he presented. Okay. Yeah, and, and um, I honestly, I skipped a lot of, I only watched the first hour and the last 15 minutes. And then the intro Python stuff I skipped because I've taught intro NumPy and Pandas before. So I just skipped it. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, hey, this is standard in R, but you have to go pack <laughs> Python kind of things. But yeah, so pretty much what I, what I found when I went to the fast book, chapter 10 was actually on... Um, NLP. So I assume that we were talking about the chapter 10 that was on here on the diffusers. Um, but just kind of introducing high level, and then we'll do the actual deep dive that was part of the uh, um, kind of the, it wasn't part of the fast book. It was, yeah, we're the, the book is left behind now. Um, it's okay. not going to be used for us. So when we say what I think when the uh, um, Probably says chapter 10. Yeah, it does. So it's really less than 10. Maybe we should, I don't know if I can. Okay, yeah, less than 10, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. so um, one of the considerations here is we're working with larger data. How can we do so? We do so um, with different I changed structures. It. <laughs> uh, sorry, go ahead. I changed it on the uh, spreadsheet, so now it says less. I think. Uh, 
Yeah. And so basically you're able to work with these large data sets without uh, overloading or being too computationally expensive by breaking them down into chunks and sending those in um, over an iteration there. And then kind of the last concept is here is understanding the chunking data with iterators, which is again, taking the data set into manageable size chunks um, that are used in the training inference one. Um, again, on large data sets and um, you know, as iterations, you can scale them and, and so on as you go through the data to pipeline. Now, diffusers themselves, um, it has a lot of great information in here. Um, this is what was linked. Let me get to the actual model specifically the, here. The iterator is when you don't, or was it the, that's when you don't load it all in memory at once, right? Or yes, I don't remember. You, you, you bet, send in a batch of these, you say the, this much, then this much, and then this much. Um, yeah, okay. You go and go through where the chunks is, you basically have like a predefined set that you put in, train off of, then you send another one and keep going there. So these are kind of more, I would assume more on the, as it mentions here, like on the fly. Oh yeah, the generator. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Thanks. so I, I think from what I'm understanding on um, the computational part of that is that all of that would be stored, um, like it's not written on the hard drive or the, sorry, the I'm, I'm not gonna go down that path because I yeah <laughs> we're on that one. Um, but yeah, so one thing that I thought was really interesting um, going through this was how much we kept getting sent back to the basic Python stuff. Um, but I wanted to pull up the hugging face for the fashion. I miss it. It's in an ST. And, and that was used in that paper walkthrough? Is that where that came? That was used in the uh, the distillation paper? Yeah, so that, that distillation paper is basically what led into the um, diffusion. Okay. Well, yeah, so... Um, I didn't, that video I didn't watch, the one on the, the walkthrough in the paper. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so, two hours of video is what all I got time for. <laughs> yeah. This guy likes a lot. I don't know. This guy likes watching lots of videos. Yeah. All right. For some reason, I have lost where the actual, this one keeps bringing me to another one, but um, we'll go through that. But basically what we're looking at with um, on here is really just kind of, um, there are pipelines that you can use for inference with minimal code amount. And it, uh, it, it is usability over performance, simple over easy, um, and can, can customize over abstractions. Um, and it's, it's a library that has quite a bit of fundamental and other useful information in it. So the constraints that we were really working on building through this was really that it was in Python, only using the Python standard library, Matplotlib, and Jupyter Notebooks um, with MBDVB. So as we dive through here, uh, here we go. This is where I wanted to go. Um, stable diffusion. Um, so there are a couple different ones here, and you can't do illegal things with it, uh, but it's a one that you can install directly in there. And looking through here, you basically have the pipeline um, already generated for you. Um, and what you're doing is generating images from text based off of this uh, pre-trained one. So this one specifically, um, it uh, pulls from this model uh, and then you tell it something that you want to create an image of and you get this really cool looking image. Um, and each time that you run it, even on the same code, it does do something different. So if you ran this over and over again, you would have maybe the flag is in the front or something like that. Or there's no flag or whatever. Um, so the idea here is that really what you can do is generate images um, for specific categories and so on. So it's a way for um, it's a more simple, straightforward approach to take generation. Now, the more you look at these things, the more they 
don't make sense. Like, for example, it looks like the horse only has two legs and, and so on. So, you know, it's not exact and kind of weird. Don't know what to do, how to draw hands situation going there uh, and so on. So this is a, a great one to go through to, again, less on that performance, more on the usability of it. Uh, again, if you want to go further more into the diffusers, there are the pre-chain models that are in there. Um, but it basically, it's like it trains it, it takes it and it uh, populates the image area with noise and then comes in and actually uh, um, places where it is. So it's interesting. So they have the tutorials and how to guides. Now, that's pretty much what we were seeing here. And... Looking through here, um, there's some video display, so that wasn't it, but we do have NumPy up here, which was kind of there, but we'll take a look to see how it is. So in loading the models, um, there's the auto encoder one. And I'm just curious if it would make more sense to show it on Google Colab. Do you all have a preference between Colab and Super Notebook dark mode or light? No. All right, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll stick with the one here and then we can go back. So, um and so when you download the hugging face and the diffusers here we're importing the auto encoder kl and so on and let me just pull up the documentation for the diffusers package That's going to bring me right back. So here is a GitHub on diffusers. And as we look through here, say the same kind of concept here, but um, what I wanted to do is look at the yeah, so here's the one with the Yeah, so I guess the proper term is unconditional image generation, uh, utilizing that. Um, so the training config is a class that has the training hyperparameters in them. And I'll put this next to each other so we can look at the documentation next to the code there. Um, but what we're looking for is the implementation of this. To get a little bit more detail on each part of those. Now, how this will really, I guess, work through in the kind of a, the steps of the tasks that they kind of outlined. And uh, there was a really great resource, if you didn't come across it, that outlines uh, based off of student notes what the um, steps are before we, uh, of the code. So basically, we have to download the uh, MIST model, um, and then we have to we have a gzip package that we have to separate out. And I never knew that pickle was the the term for st um, standard Python files. I thought it was uh, something else. But basically, with the standard Python library, um, you can use the gzip library and pickle, which are both um, built-in functions to unzip and separate the parts. Then taking the list, changing it into a matrix, um, using yield and next, which are the generators, um, to go, go through those, and then we can visualize. And then we start getting into the actual PyTorch where we um, go to the PyTorch sensor. We map that to each of the um, components reshape it because we're working with matrices and then we can um, kind of play around with some randomizers with this. And we'll go through this a little bit more. Here is loading the models. And as we go into here, um, this one is more in depth into 
details. There's more if we actually want to just see a simplified pipeline. There are two existing ones that we could look through, uh, but this one's actually getting under the hood on, on that. And I guess based off of where you all are with the book, do you want to go into the more in depth or would you like to see more of that high level simplified pipeline um, in the documentation part of it? I think oh, the high level is better for me personally. Yeah, like, that's okay. right. Liz Torn has a strong reference <laughs> no you first you'll okay sorry i woke up this morning with uh my cat knocked over water all over my desk and i'm out of keyboard and apparently this but things haven't been fully working out with me um yeah so uh, this is what you all had seen before and we kind of walk through it here which is basically to do this so we could go ahead and come over here which for some reason i can't add over here so that's annoying. Um, we could run these in there, but um, what was interesting was kind of the approach of those constraints of not using the other packages and using just base of the language, because normally you kind of think of all oh, these packages do this all for you, you know, what, what, what needs to happen and so on. So I thought that was going to be interesting, but given that each time the image or this is run, we get a separate image each time. That is kind of an interesting concept. I'm curious how, have you all needed or can think of a use case for the a generated image? that you all come across. What do you mean? I mean, yeah, so I guess- it, it, So you it, use them all the time. <laughs> oh, oh, you do, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Like, is it for a specific uh, projects or is it like a hobby thing? Uh, yeah. Truthfully, are. I've used them mostly for hobby things, like generate me a character, a uh, picture for my character for my Dungeons and Dragons game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, I mean, also though, these kind of models are built into things like Photoshop. They're useful there now too. Like you do generative mm -hmm. fill. Um, if you want to take something out of the background, it's much better than the the old the old uh, stamp fill or whatever you used to use, clone fill, or whatever. Now you can do generative fill and it'll just guess and make up things that look perfect. You know. Oh yeah, that, that is good. Um, I was hoping that this would run, but apparently this has been updated. So uh, what I'll do instead is I'll follow along the walk through here because. It, even though it's more in that in depth, it's I think a little bit less in depth uh, than the one because, uh, and this is available if you go through, it's part of one of the student notes, but basically we're downloading it. And then this path process of it, uh, something kind of to consider when working with these is this will auto generate the uh, file path where you wanna go. Uh, rather than having to hard code it somewhere. So if somebody was to update or open this on their computer, but they have data there, they still would be able to get to it, even if the folders aren't necessarily needing the same thing. So so the then, real value of that path library is um, that it works really well. Like you switch computer systems. Like I don't know if you've ever worked with Windows and Mac, but if you switch back and forth, your paths can get messed up because Windows uses one convention and the Mac and Unix uses a different convention. So this makes it kind of platform independent when you use the path library. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that before, but I, I do see a lot of times where like the, even the uh, quotation marks get switched to uh, tick marks and then the yeah. slashes change direction. Um, but yeah, so in that path up there, I uh, just wanted to point that out just because I'm already started, but you see where it says local path slash train images. Um, that slash is not a string, right? That's an operator. That's a Python operator that's been defined for this path class. And so it's actually com com calculating the path correctly for whatever computer system it's on. So it's a backslash one way or the backslash the other way, depending on what it, that's all done automatically. It's kind of cool. So even though it looks like this, it, it will adjust. Depending yeah, on that's an screen. operator. That's an operator. It's actually um, under defined in the, in the path library. That's good path to know. Class. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I was just, um, yeah, I didn't, I, I had never put this together. I was always putting it like as a string almost uh, to get to that, but um, awesome. Cool. 
cool. Um, yeah, so here is the structure of what's in there. We have, we're not working with text and we're not looking, working um, with images, we're, we're working with bytes. Um, and so we are, um, we're gonna as a binary file, um, and then we're loading that data in the memory. So again, we're looking at the pixels um, and based on the where the pixels we get where the image is within that 28 by 28. So is a um, quick math in my head here. So that's 784 is 28 times uh, squared. So that's where that number comes from um, to get that dimension. Okay, so this does vary differently than when he talks in the video about like his own use cases of it, but um, getting more into categorizing based off of specific labels, for example. So um, could it take um, a dictionary? So I was looking at how that, oh, he changed the list down here. Yeah, sorry. So um, could he, uh, based on this list, what kind of image could we work with? So this is one of those 28 by 28 grayscale images. And uh, you know, knowing that we're looking at clothing items and fashion things, it kind of seems like a shoe. But if you weren't told that initially, this could look like a smiling cloud or some other things. Uh, so having that good. <laughs> So yeah, if you it, if you squint or look at it far away, it definitely is a shoe. It's just you're zoom you when you're so close to it, all you see is the boxes, <laughs> the pixels. It's kind yeah, of that's a good point too. Um there's low resolution. Yeah, they're, they're definitely the lower resolution. And you know, that's kind of where like it can still show these, uh be trained on them and told them what they are, even if they're not crystal clear images. Um and so here is the a chunks function. I like the name chunks, but basically you have an iteration in here. And what you're doing is um, you're iterating over uh, that and then creating these uh, list of sub arrays of the values that go through. And basically it's the same, but um, you know, this is on the, um, by simplifying this part of it um, is not ideal because of the memory usage that I'm taking up by this array. So working with the generator, it recommends to use yield, which is part of the Python, and that will only tell it how many to pick at a certain time. So once you get up to a certain value, it will stop and um, grow that out. So we have the 784 pixels and there's 60,000 images within here. And we'll keep, we'll yield and go to the next, yield next until we get uh, the stop iteration error. So at the end of our iteration, it will error out um, the code here. So this is where it's a bit different than probably normal usage of Python is most of the time you hear matrix, matrix you're saying NumPy. There's no NumPy here. Instead, um, it's basically um, a way to, would, would you he call it a tuple? I always call it a tuple. Have you all heard it one way or the other? I usually say tuple. Yeah, I say tuple as well, but I have heard tuple. Okay. I don't know which is correct. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things that's out there. But so now we have a um, tuple. I guess that makes sense. Um, that we can now um, start um, we could replace all that and do in the tensor obje uh, object here as well. So uh, rather than you know, that way we can specify the values here and now we can map all of our values so that we can test um, train test split or I guess train valid on this is how it's called there. Um, and now we have, we can see that we have the 60,000 images at 784 within here. And 
looking at this, we can find some more information about each of those. And then where this really comes into play here at the end of this is creating random numbers. Uh, it links to this kind of lava lamps with encryption. So kind of how do you play around or how do you have uh, these so that the they randomly generate based on when they light up um, and use that to encrypt information. And so the purpose on this one is this is the previous algorithm that had been used prior. Um, it was called used before Python 2.3, so well in the past, because um, I think the last one was 2.7 and 20, when they cut that off, so Wickham Hill algorithm. And when we look at the seed, this is how, when you set the seed or so that you can reproduce it, this is how it would determine what, what type of um, values were. So it's gives us what the number starts with um, is really at the end of the day. Um, and that will help with, so when you say set C to 42, it's gonna start with 42. And um, we're gonna be updating the values in that random state till we get to the numbers that we need to. Um, it's meant to be reproducible. That's the main goal of this. So random, 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 uh, you, you get ones. It's not the fastest, but again, you can see that running it, we can run it by itself or by setting a seed, we could make it so it's uh, readable. I love the mashing of keyboard numbers. So a part of it here is really focusing on the time difference and saving uh, between doing a loop, or in this case, uh, um, we have that list comprehension here and comparing that to the torch. And um, so you can see that we're looking at microseconds with torch. So that's to the negative ninth in milliseconds, which would be negative three seconds. So that's microseconds versus milliseconds. It's a pretty big difference on uh, scale. Um, and so over 60,000 and so on. I mean, that's a factor of quite a bit more. And then they dive into what the actual the random or rand in algorithm looks like in, in high torch more so than the standard uh, seed and rand that you would see in base Python. Yeah, that's the part of the video I watched at the end. And that was, yeah, that that code chunk, that, those those forking down there. The forking. I thought that was an interesting discussion about how only one of the functions actually gives you different random numbers on when you fork. Yeah, I remember it was basically only the built-in yeah. standard library one did, I think. But yeah, the other so one, it, it, it actually looked at this a little bit. And it turns out that NumPy has uh, some things to say about this. And it says the right way to do this is to use the spawn. It has a generator spawn that'll generate a uh, independent generator for you in each thread. You just have to call spawn on your generator. And then in torts, they don't have a spawn, but they say that you can just like take the seed and like add one to it or something and just for each thread or something like that. That's how you handle that. But you do have to handle it explicitly. And I've read, I I don't know what, what the Python standard library is doing, but I would rather handle it directly because you you know you want things to be reproducible. So you want to be able to be able to put the same master seed and hopefully get the same things back. Oh, I see how yeah, you did that there. You did seed zero and seed one. Right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of thing you could do. Like some people just use whatever the seed you're using for the session, then you just like increment it for each process ID or add the process ID or something like that. To get um to get an independent one in each not all random number generators uh work like that where like you know, a generator with one seed is independent of a generator with a seed is one higher but the torch one apparently is they claim and, and that does go quite a bit um on that but yeah so basically if it's if they're running parallel on the same you get the same numbers so the fix on that 
one of the, it sounds like one of the fixes would be to um, just alter the uh, seed number. Yeah. To those. And instead of hard coding the zero and one, you could have this tied to the. A master seed. Yeah. I think you're going to do it. I'm not sure. I'm no, uh, no multi-processing expert or anything like that. So. <laughs> There was one other one I wanted to pull up. Um, but uh, yeah, so there was this one. Hello, and welcome back to Data Science Cast Notes. Whoa. Something came through here. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, thinking, like it, Peter. I'm like, what's going on? Now, I'm still learning what is or is not working properly on this, I guess. Like, I can't move uh, certain things. Hopefully, I don't have to get a new computer. Um, like, but, uh, yeah, so there is, this is what was going off. Was ah, okay. Talking through the fast sampling and diffusion models um, and kind of walking through the paper in more detail um, going through it. So if you wanted to get more into that. That was what that one um, was, that was going off. Uh, but the, this is the one that might be helpful as you're looking to on the iterators and the generators. Um, uh, <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. That's a generator. Now we know. That yeah. looks like under the hood. Iteration <laughs> basically allows you to loop through an iterable um, without uh, using a for loop. So in Python, usually you're, you're taught like do a for loop and then you kind of learn about the list comprehension and then you can actually create a list iterator um, and each time that it's called or with the next it just pulls the next item in that list um, slice again inclusive exclusive when you uh, slice in python so this starts at zero goes up to but not including five you still get five elements back, but it'd be zero, one, two, three, four as the um, index number. So that's important there, Python thing. And this will give you back a portion or a slice of the numbers um, based on what you put there. And again, the iter iter iterable here allows it also to be dynamic um, and only have to be called once. And each time that you call it, see how at the last part here well there's nothing left for it to call because it showed you the first five numbers second five numbers if you try to iterate again it doesn't error out it just gives you an empty empty list so that's something to consider as you go through there yeah so this is what the error that you would normally get in working with python you get um like you might not Unless you're doing some sort of a cert error, you might have this running and be like, okay, I ran through, it worked fine, but you didn't stop in time. So you just passed in an empty list, which could cause problems where you like, usually you hear like none types or something because something didn't calculate prior. Um, so the idea here is um, kind of using this stop iteration to prevent it. Um, again, it reads it in order here, but that chunks, that's that uh, function that was user defined function that was shown in there. And that's what this is doing is it basically is running the iterable, but as soon as it's done, instead of returning an empty string, it does create. So it's almost like a, a cert statement, if you will, uh, or cert error where you're basically like um, assert that there's yeah. a response here that meets the requirements and that there's not error out. Did, sorry, did you have some? That, that's someone. No, that was just a cough. Sorry. Okay. Now I gotta play around with this. Uh, see what kind of spaceman and unicorn I can get put together there. I tried to um, generate some images last week during the video, and my prompt I think was too complicated, and they all looked very bad. <laughs> Do they, when they look bad, I guess the varying degrees of bad, like, does it seem like it's not? Well, so the prompt was like a bison kissing a Labrador retriever. And it basically tried to take 
pictures that either had two dogs or two bison and like morphed one into the other and it never really quite got there and they all they yeah <laughs> it looked horrible nice um yeah to me this is definitely has the potential borderline ethical considerations and everything then also uh, there so uh, it would be interesting to see like a lot of companies and a lot of application schools are basically saying no gen ai uh, can be a part of this or something like that is um, yes, I think you mentioned earlier about kind of these processes being used in um, Photoshop and everything is at what point are we like you think of Photoshop oh you take something out of the image versus that's enough to say hey we can't like these generative AIs can't be used it's kind of like how generative AI like text responses are being purposely excluded or marked or flagged for various reasons like these types of images and and so on, do you see any, I mean, I guess I know what the, there's that, that big case about the the pictures being generated of real people um, that's causing problems. But um, in these cases, like when you are, say you want to put a picture of something to use elsewhere, like have you all, come across or seen anything further about that? I haven't seen any solutions, no. No, we talked a little bit about it a couple weeks ago in the ethics yeah, section, the ethics. But... but. I mean, I can imagine like, like celebrities are gonna have to deal with not just paparazzis anymore and um, Yeah, it's, I, I don't know what the official terms are or whatever, but it's like one of like how the study of like how poor like um, eyewitness reports are and the memory of that and so oh, on. Yeah. You know, someone seeing a picture and being like, okay, I saw that and, and our brains were kind of like, okay, we're used to right. that there. There is that Photoshop identifier uh, where they can identify if an image has been oh, Photoshopped, sure. but I don't know if that's been applied to this to see if it would yeah i think uh, watermarking i've heard as is one idea for both images and text generation but i don't know i have no idea how it would work yeah i've been noticing um because i i use um gen ai kind of as google if you will that if i copy from some places it copies over an image with it which causes it to not come out i'm just curious if that has anything to do with that but um i found that to be something recent not so much like a couple months ago and it's like i would copy something like of uh, just text but it somehow brought over an image that wasn't part of what i selected so it must have been underlying there somewhere and i posted a picture in slack for you there torn <laughs> but that's what dolly can come up with with that prompt That's actually, uh, and what, so that's really what, cute. What were you getting, uh, when you, when you got it back? Well, she was using probably the diffuser model, the notebook it? from last time. Yeah, yeah I it, can put it in what here. You, what if you yeah, put, in, a, put it in like a modern years. model, like Dolly, then Dolly three, then you get a lot better. And then my partner, I think he also used Dolly, and I think he, he was able to get one that looked like our dog. Oh, cool. No. I don't know if he, I think he might have did the, like, I don't know if he gave it a picture of our dog first. I can't remember. No, I have newer to the Gen a, uh, AI image uh, part, but comparative to setting up Dolly and having that run to generate this, how does the diffuser model, is it about the same amount of lift is... Or is there more involved? Well, this is a this is an online service, right? So you, this, in fact, now it's integrated with ChatGPT 4.0. So you just like throw it in your conversation. Hey, make a picture for me. And it does. <laughs> is funny. that a, that's part of the paid ChatGPT? I I don't know because I do have the paid one. I don't know if you can also do oh, okay. a free one. I think you can though. I think you can do some small number of them per day or something. 
Okay, that looks like I a, uploaded the one, my <laughs> cursed image. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, so yeah, I think what it did, what it was doing was like taking either two dogs or two bison and then trying to morph uh, one into the other. Mm -hmm. So like the bison in this one has like puppy eyes and fur on its leg. I mean, I still think it's always pretty amazing. I mean, who was who was the guy that was sitting around going, "Hey, I got an idea. Let's train a model to take re remove noise from pictures. We'll add noise and train a model to get it out." And then we'll start with just noise and see what happens when we remove it. I mean, I would have never, somebody would say, hey, you want to try this? I said, that will waste your time. That's not going to work. <laughs> and then it does these amazing things. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I mean, so the power yeah, really. of the gradient descent, man, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> pretty crazy. Awesome. Yeah, so that's really what I had was kind of to go walk through in some of the resources as I was going through it. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more clicking through to learn more on the technical side, but I think that's what is so uh, so great and about like the transformers and these is that they are pretty much out of the box, if you will. Of um, you know, you can download it and run it and generate without having to create a lot of different. Um, uh, code and everything and still get something closer uh, similar or have something to laugh at but yeah um I, I yeah. do need to uh, hop off um uh, but yeah I'm, uh, sorry again that i'm not here like every every uh, week is just, this time slot has really become a difficult part for me but um 